Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You have no other reason to smile this morning. You can smile at the fact that today is a day that God has made. Amen. So now I'll just go ahead and rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. This morning I'm going to talk to you about the gospel. Yes, sir. More specifically, one particular aspect of the gospel. Yeah. We can look around and see these empty seats. Amen. And we can see that we in desperate need of the gospel. Yeah, yeah. Amen. You can look at any recent study done today and you'll see a drastic decline in church membership. Yeah. We live in a country where People think that just because they can say that I'm from the United States of America, that they're Christians. Yeah, yes, yeah. But what they don't understand is just because you claim it yes. doesn't make it so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for some of us in this room, yes. uh, in every church in America on a Sunday morning, yes. not everybody in church is in Christ. Amen. 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 And we have a problem with the gospel. Yeah. Right? We have a problem with the gospel. Yes. Amen. Among people who are supposed to preach the gospel. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Come on. Amen. Come on. Some of us, they will boldly claim that I don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. All right now. Yeah. Now, how can you call yourself a Christian if you don't know what converted you? Mm -hmm. yes. uh -huh. How can you Amen. claim to have faith if you say you don't know what to say? Well, all right. what did you hear and what did you believe? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, tell them the same thing you heard. Tell them the same thing that you believe. Yes. Some of us are ashamed of the gospel. Well, all mm -hmm. We live Amen. such wretched lives that yes, we bring discredit upon God and Christ well, and the church. So we are ashamed to preach the gospel. My God. And some of us are just plain old scared. Mm -hmm. Amen. We suffer from gospel anxiety. Yeah. All right. We we we're so scared to uh, offend people. We're so scared to rough rough feathers. Uh, I like this. I love this line from Vody Bachman. He says, "Church folk believe too much into the eleventh commandment: mm. Thou shalt be nice." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and oftentimes we are combat. We are contentious, right? We preach everything but Christ. Mm. We yeah. preach the church. Yeah. We engage in doctrinal dilemmas. We, we, we question your choice of wardrobe. Yeah. So we talk about everything but the gospel. Mm -hmm. And if I was to take a sermon on a survey this morning and ask each and every one of you what is the gospel, you wouldn't begin the gospel where you should. You'll start at the end. Mm -hmm. You'll say the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And that is correct, but that's only part of the gospel. Yes. That's the end yes. of the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. So right. this morning, I want to talk about that particular aspect that's at the beginning of the yes. gospel. Mm. So our lesson text comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Verse 1 states that the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Amen. 
now John clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, yeah. whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. Yeah. Indeed, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I want to preach and teach this morning from the subject, Where Do I Begin? Where Do I Begin? When I sat down to prepare this lesson, I found myself wrestling with this very question. Where do I begin? With everything there is to know about Jesus, with everything he has said, with everything he has done, where do I begin? My parents ought to say amen, because when that beautiful wide-eyed child of yours walked up to you and asked you where the babies come from, you stood there in that awkward moment with that awkward pause, wondering, where do I begin? My college students ought to wave a hand because you got up early on Saturday morning to write that research paper that you knew was due by Monday, but you found yourself staring at your computer and watching your cursor blank for an hour and 15 minutes trying to figure out where do I begin? You have never planned a funeral a day in your life and mama just died. Okay? And in the midst of your misery, at the height of your pain, Everybody keeps asking you when the funeral is. Yeah. And at one of the darkest moments in your life, you are forced to answer the question, where do I begin? Yeah. Sisters, you have just reached that place that we call, that's enough. Yeah. Because you had enough of all his cheating, you're tired of all his lying, you're done with all the beatings, and it stops today. You pack your bags, you grab your babies, and you hit that one-way road to a new life. Your past is in the rear view, the future is on the horizon, and all of a sudden, the reality of uncertainty hits you. You pull over with your flashes on, the sound of the rain is hitting the windshield and tears are streaming down your face because for the first time in a long time, you are forced to answer the question, where do I begin? Mm. All right. mm. Beloved, in all of our lives, we will experience moments of uncertainty, okay. but the gospel shouldn't be one of them. Okay. All right. And it is my hope and it is my prayer that by the end of this lesson, you can learn a few things from Mark about overcoming gospel anxiety. Amen. Now, in my last sermon entitled, The Hand Behind the Pen, we learned that while God is the divine author of this gospel, Mark is regarded as the human author who spoke from God being carried along by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We also learn that the Holy Spirit had placed Mark and Peter into a God-ordained relationship to write this gospel, with God doing the speaking, Peter doing the preaching, and Mark doing the writing. Peter preached the word publicly in the streets of Rome, and he declared the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mark passed down to us in writing everything that Peter preached. He wrote down accurately whatsoever he could remember of the things that were said and done by Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now you should know that the idea for writing this gospel did not come from Peter nor did it come from Mark. The idea for writing this gospel came from the people. Before Mark put pen to paper, he received a visit from the people. Yeah. Now before the rumors get started, it's not like they didn't like Peter. They loved Peter. They loved what Peter preached. 
The problem was they couldn't understand a word that Peter preached. Amen. Amen. It's like when you call customer service and you don't and you get someone, you don't get someone from the US. You get somebody from overseas. Yeah. Now God bless his heart. He was really trying to help me. But here I am on the phone an hour longer than I should be because I can't understand a word that he's saying. Okay. It got to the point where I just had to tell him, man, I don't mean no harm, but you got to get me somebody who speaks better English. Peter was preaching, but the people weren't receiving. Their Roman ears rejected his Hebrew lips. That's why the Holy Spirit partnered Mark and Peter together to write this gospel. Peter's job was to do the preaching. Mark's job was to do the interpreting. Mark could do what Peter couldn't. That was speak the language of the people. Yeah. Mark could break it down in a way that they could understand. Mark could break it down to his least common denominator. He could make it make sense for them. Mark was what we call in the IT world, user friend. So the people came to Mark and they asked Mark to write down what Peter preached. And if you allow me for a moment, I want to invoke my preaching prerogative and suggest to you that upon hearing this request, Mark sat down in a place of ponder and he entered into a moment of meditation as he wrestled with the question, where do I begin? My brothers and my sisters, I stopped by on a Sunday morning to ask you, where do you begin when you are called upon to deliver the gospel? Where do you begin when someone comes to you and they ask you to give them the good news? When they don't stop by the church, when they don't want to talk to the preacher, when they just tell evangelists is not getting it done, when they come directly to you and they ask you, where do you begin? Well, can I give you three suggestions from Mark that will help you decide on where to begin? Suggestion number one, begin with the person of promise. Begin with the person of promise. When Mark sat down to write this gospel, he began with who this gospel is about. Okay? He didn't begin with the sign outside. He didn't talk about what you got on. He didn't engage in a conversation about worship practices and doctrinal issues. No, he began with who this gospel is about. He announces in chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The word gospel means good news. Mark says that Jesus is the beginning of the good news. Just in case you didn't know, the gospel is about Jesus. Amen. 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 The gospel is not about the church. The gospel is not about the, your choice of wardrobe. The gospel is not about what you do on Sunday morning. Yeah. The gospel is about Jesus Christ. Amen. So when you open your mouth to deliver the gospel, when you part your lips to spread the good news, you need to begin with who this gospel is about. Amen. This gospel, and say it with me, is about Jesus. Amen. Amen. Some of y'all didn't say it. Yeah. The gospel is about Jesus. Jesus. And not only is the gospel about Jesus, not only should you begin with Jesus, you should also begin with Jesus and who Jesus is. And that's the million dollar question. Who is he? Who is Jesus? Okay. This question has been at the center of controversy for almost 2,000 years. And guess what? Jesus knew it. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus was training his disciples, and he hit them with a pop quiz. He asked them, who do men say that I am? Right. 
Yeah. And they say, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And then Jesus got real personal with them. Yeah. And he asked them, who did you say that I am? And Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, one of Jesus' best friends says, you are the Christ, yeah. the Son of the living God. Well, Jesus is not some imposter as the Jews would suggest. Jesus is not just one of the other prophets as the Muslims would claim. Okay. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yeah. And then Jesus goes on to say, blessed are you, Simon bon John. For you didn't get that from no man. Yeah. You didn't yeah. get that from your mama. Yeah. You didn't get that from your daddy. The, the scribes didn't cover it on uh, in Sunday school. Yeah, yeah. That was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. That was given to you directly from my Father in heaven. Amen. Amen. So if Peter is the source of Mark's gospel, meaning that if Mark wrote down what Peter said, then everything that Peter talked about, out of everything that Peter talked about, this one confession, this one truth, is the foundation of the gospel. Amen. And this is why Mark thought it necessary to announce that the beginning of the gospel is about Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Typically, <laughs> when someone asks, who are you? Yeah. Come on, son. <laughs> your natural response is to give your name. Mm -hmm. Well, just in case you didn't know, Jesus Christ is not his name. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. This is not what you'll find on his birth certificate. Right, right. You won't see this on his ID card when this Pharisee stops and frisks him for healing on the Sabbath. Yeah, yeah. Jesus Christ is not his name. Now some of you are laughing, but there's people in this world who actually think that Jesus is his first name and that Christ is his last name. Right. Now right. Jesus is his first name, but Christ is not his last name. Christ is a title. The reason that Jesus is good news is because he is the Christ or the Messiah. Now you're not used to the word Messiah, but Messiah is the Hebrew word and Christ is the Greek word to describe God's anointed one. Now beloved, this is one of the lessons that I believe that we should learn from Mark. Because in Mark, God fulfills the promises that God has made about the coming Messiah. The Bible records all the way back to Genesis 3.15, the first promise that God has made about the coming Messiah. It is in chapter 3 that Adam and Eve sins and God shows up to give them the consequences of their sin. And it's in chapter 3 where God says, your seed will crush the head of Satan. And it is in chapter 3 that we find this first promise of the coming of Jesus. And from Genesis chapter 3 all the way to the Gospel of Mark, there are 414 promises of the coming of the Son of God. 414 promises that the Messiah will come. 414 promises that Satan will not win. 414 promises that God will defeat sin. 414 promises from the God in heaven that Jesus will come. God made a promise that Jesus will show up. And just in case you didn't know, God does not make idle promises. Amen. Some of y'all act like this ain't the church of Christ. Come on. God does not make idle promises. Amen. What God says, God will do. Whatever God promises, God will perform. God does not make idle promises. God is faithful to the promises that he has made. 
if God says he'll work everything for your good, he will. If he says no weapon formed against you shall prosper, it won't. If he says that he will supply all your needs, warm it up, Chris, he's about to. If he says that he will forgive your sins, they are forgiven. God is faithful to the promises he has made. He will never make a promise that he will not fulfill. And Jesus is good news because he fulfills the promises that God has made. Mark sets the precedence for those who would declare the gospel but don't know where to begin. He says you're there if you begin at a place where the gospel begins with who, with Jesus and who Jesus is. If you begin with Jesus as the Messiah who will come and establish his kingdom on earth and bring peace to the world, you're there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. If you begin with Jesus as the Son of God who is the divine source of forgiveness and eternal life, you're there. Yes, if you begin with Jesus as the fulfillment of the promises of God, yes. you are there. Yes. Begin with the person of promise. Like that. yeah. That's suggestion number one. Mm -hmm. Here's suggestion number two. Begin with the place of promise. Okay. Begin with the place of promise. Mark knew that when he announced that Jesus was the coming Messiah, he would have to offer proof. And he offered proof from the prophets. He says in verse 2, it is written in the prophets, Behold, I sent my messenger. Mm -hmm. This is God yeah. talking, saying he's sending his messenger before your face. Yes, he's talking to Jesus. He's telling Jesus, I'm going to send a messenger to, for you, to go ahead of you. Mm -hmm. And he says, this messenger will prepare your way before you. Yes, this messenger will be the one, the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Yeah, yeah. Mark identifies this messenger as John the Baptist. Okay. John is the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Yeah. So it is in the wilderness where John begins his ministry. Yes. And for clarity's sake, you need to understand that the wilderness that we think about is not the wilderness that Mark is talking about. Yeah, yeah, See, when yeah, we think yeah. of wilderness, we think of high mountains with tall trees, yeah, yeah. low valleys with long rivers. Right. Right. The Judean wilderness that Mark speaks of is a barren desert of sun beat stone and sand. Yeah. And it is a symbol of a place of isolation. It is a symbol of solitude. So to understand why God chose the wilderness, we have to go all the way back to Moses and the children of Israel. When God called Moses to lead his people out of Egypt and into the wilderness. And God carried them into the wilderness for three reasons. The first reason that God carried them into the wilderness is so that they can come to know him. Amen. Amen. After 400 years of captivity in Egypt, it is in the wilderness where the people finally get to meet their God. Right. It is in the wilderness where they learn the law of God. It is in the wilderness where they are led by God. Y'all remember that? Cloud by day, fire by night. Yes, it is in the wilderness where they were taken care of by God. Yeah. Their clothes and their shoes yeah. never wore out. Yeah. God led them into the wilderness so that they could come to know him. Yeah. The second reason God carried them into the wilderness is so that he could separate and isolate them from the influences of Egypt. Yeah, 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 yeah. Have you ever noticed that you're a better person when certain people aren't around. Say that. Say that. Say that. Now, you'll never do that until yeah. they are around. Yeah. 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 Come on. 
She never took a drink until yeah. she came around. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like that. She never dressed that way until right. she comes around. Right, right, right. You never do that until they are around. Mm -hmm. See, God has a way of separating you from certain people and certain things and putting you into isolation and a place of isolation so that you can come to know God. The wilderness separates you and isolates you from worldly influences so that you can, it, and creates a safe space for you to meet God and to know God. So God carried them into the wilderness so he can separate and isolate them from the worldly influences. Yeah, yeah. The third reason that God carries them into the wilderness, somebody hit that slide for me. The third reason God carries them into the wilderness is so that you're going to help me out and click the slide, please. <laughs> Coming of Christ is a fact. 
every person in here, every person in this world will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. You will give an account of yourself to God. This is a fact. So then, why are we not the people? Why are we in a state of unpreparedness? And if you allow me a moment of transparency, I just want to let you know that I wrestled with this question for a long time. Yeah. I threw a whole lot of mud against the wall to see what would stick. Yeah. Yeah. And I narrowed it down to one major problem. Sin. Yeah. Sin is the reason you're not prepared for his coming. I like that. Come on. And interestingly enough, sin was the reason he was coming. He was coming to die for the sins of the world. But before he could do that, the way needed to be prepared. John's job was to prepare the way. And he was to do that by crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, and make his path straight. The word prepare means to get something ready. The word way literally means road. The idea of preparing the way comes from an ancient custom of sending the servants ahead of the king to clear and level the roads so they can make them passable for the king. Mm -hmm. Israel needed to prepare their minds for the arrival of Jesus. They needed to clear out all the spiritual debris yeah. and make straight any crooked paths of unrighteousness. In other words, Jesus can't reach you with all that sin in the way. Wow. Wow. Jesus can't get to you with all that selfishness blocking his path. He cannot ride down that raggedy road of unrighteousness to reach you if you do not prepare the way. Amen. So how do we do that? How do we prepare the way? Well, number one, preparing the way means preaching. Yeah. For Mark and for John the Baptist and for you and I, preparing the way means preaching. Now, we like to say things like the best sermons are seen and not heard mm. and preach the gospel at all times and use words when necessary. And that sound real sweet, don't it? Yeah. That sound yeah. real nice. It's real catchy. Yeah. Got a religious connotation. But guess what? Mm -hmm. That's the opposite of what Mark says. Okay. Amen. Right. Yeah. And I'm going to take it even a step further to say and suggest that it's unbiblical. Oh. It's unbiblical to say that you can preach the gospel without actually having to speak. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that you don't have to live right because you do. Yeah. What I am saying is this, that in order for you to preach the gospel, you're going to have to open your mouth and speak. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In verse 4, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins yeah. or the forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. Verse 7 says, he preached, saying, there comes one after me who is mightier than I, yeah. whose sandal strap I'm not even worthy to stoop down and loose. Yeah. Mark, John said something. Yeah. He used his words. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to prepare the way for Jesus, you're going to have to use your words and not just your actions. Yes, right. Preparing the way means preaching. Yeah. Number two, preparing the way means repenting. Okay. It means dealing with your sin. Yes, sir. One of the major themes of this passage that John preached was repentance. God is calling each and every one of us to turn from sin, to turn from unrighteousness, to turn from your selfish desires, to turn from your worldly lusts, and return to God. Amen. He is calling you to change what Paul likes to call the inner man. All right. All right. All right. All right. 
He's calling you to change your mind about sin. Yes. To turn from sin and to turn to God. Yeah. Preparing the way means repenting. Number three, preparing the way means obeying. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we don't like to think about this. Oh, no. When God says, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight, those were in perils. Yeah. In other words, God is not asking, yeah. he's telling. Yeah. Yeah. God is not asking you to prepare the way. He's telling you to prepare the way. Yeah. He's not asking you to make his path straight. He's telling you to make the path straight. Yeah. He's not asking you to repent. He's telling you to repent. Yeah. Paul said, I mean, uh, yeah, Paul says in Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 30, truly, these times of ignorance, God overlooked. Yeah. But now, commands some men. Oh, oh, man. Oh, man. Uh, a few good men. Oh, yeah. Man. Yeah. But now commands all men. Yeah. Everywhere. Right, no, just right here in Highway 56. Yeah. Yeah. No, just yeah. in Augusta. Uh -huh. No, everywhere yeah. to do what? Yeah. Repent. Yeah. Why, Paul? Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by who? By the yeah. man whom he has anointed. Yeah. And just in case you missed it, this is Jesus Christ, Amen. the Son. Yeah. Of the living God. Yeah. 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 Now, when John preached repentance, the people knew that those weren't his words, those were God's words. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many people I've talked to, how many people I've counseled with the Word of God who told me, I don't care what that says. Yeah. Okay. okay. And they didn't either bat an eyelash. Right. Well, they stood there flat footed, staring me eyeball to eyeball, and told me to my face, yeah. I don't care what God says. That's right. And right. truth be told, I don't have a problem with it. Yeah. Right. Because I know where he stands with God and God's word. Yeah. He just showed me the conversation for me. I just pack up my Bible and shake the dust off my feet and keep it moving. I also talk to some people who are not as bold and brazen and foolish enough to say they don't care what God says. Yeah. They're a little bit more, uh, as we say, passive aggressive. They will yeah. throw a rock and hide their hand. Oh, yeah. See, uh -huh. they, 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 they're not foolish enough to say, I don't care what God says. They try to change it up and say, I don't care what you, you say. Oh, watch out. See, they try to place the tension between me and them instead of them and God. Yeah, yeah. But I tell them the same thing the prophet said. Yeah. Mm. Those are not my words. Those are God's words. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. God is not asking you. He's telling you. Yeah. Yeah. Preparing the way means obeying. Yeah. Number four, preparing the way means respond. In Mark chapter 1, verse 5, the Bible says that all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to John, and they were baptized by John in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now, I don't care how long you've been on this earth. I don't care how many degrees you've got on your wall. I don't even care how big your Bible is. Nobody in this room can tell me what I'm thinking unless I show you or tell you. Right. Right. When you are big baptized, you are showing everybody that you have repented. Yeah. Bat uh, repentance happens on the inside. Baptism happens on the outside. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Repentance yeah. is the change of that inward man. Right. Baptism is the testimony of that change. Is the outward testimony of that change of the inward man. Right. 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 Baptism shows your repentance. Yeah. And if baptism shows everybody that you have repented, then when you confess your sins. You're telling everybody that you have repented. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible says that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yeah. See, that's what happens. When you repent, God forgives you. Yeah. 
When you turn from your sin and you turn to God, the end result is the forgiveness of sins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to give you this one for free. <laughs> Preparing the way means connecting. Preparing the way means connecting. Yeah. Verse 8 says, and this is John talking, I have baptized you with water. But he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Yes. Preparing the way means connecting. Yes. Preaching, repenting, obeying, and responding all points to Jesus. It all connects to Jesus. And I want you to compare what John says in verse 8 to what Peter preaches in Acts chapter 2 verse 38. He says, repent, John preached that, and be baptized, John preached that, in the name of Jesus Christ, John preached that, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, and receive the gift, well, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, John preached that, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. John preached that. So, all the things that you do to deal with your sin, all the things that you do to prepare the way for Christ, to make his path straight, connects and points directly to Jesus. So, when you are called upon to deliver the gospel, begin with the person of promise, Begin with the place of prophecy and begin with the plan of preparation. Amen. You know what I love about the gospel? It's for both Christians and non-Christians. Israel was the chosen people of God and they were called upon to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. And guess what? Being disciples of Christ you bear the same responsibility Amen. to the gospel. Jesus said that he was going to return for his people. In John chapter 14, he says, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Because in my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you will be also. Jesus says that he had gone to prepare a place and that he will come back to get you. Here's your first point of application. While he prepares a place, you prepare the way. Amen. Like that. While he prepares the place, go ahead and tweak that, you prepare the way. He said he's going to come back and get you one day. But he also says in Matthew chapter 24, but of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven. The only person that knows that is only God the Father. So here's your second point of application. Be, be ready so you don't have to get ready. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Be ready so you don't have to get ready. Yeah. Um, now all that applies specifically to both Christians and non-Christians. Now I want to talk directly to those who have not placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Yeah. God is calling you to believe on Jesus as the Christ the son of the living God mm -hmm. to repent and live a life of righteousness by the power of the Holy Spirit yes, to confess him as Lord and Christ and be baptized in his name and if you do that if you do that on that day of his coming when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ you can feel some assurance because he has forgiven your sins. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So as we stand and sing a song of invocation, I call upon you to reflect 
on your life. Reflect on the gospel. Work on your gospel anxiety. Please do that as we stand and sing a song of encouragement.